Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing the uh, acetylcholinesterase enzymes and the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Okay, so what we now want to look at is uh, how, um, how we're actually going to break this intermediate down, basically. Right, so what's going to happen is this carbon doesn't like having um, this negative charge here. So what's going to happen is this oxygen here is going to break this bond now. So it's got to lose a bond somewhere. It's got to lose an electron, so it's this bond that breaks. And this is the one we wanted to break, remember. This is the bond between the acetyl group here and the choline here. So this bond is going to break, and both electrons are going to go to the oxygen. Now, remember, the oxygen put one of the electrons into that bond, but the other electron was given by the carbon. Both of those electrons are now going back to the oxygen. So that means the oxygen has nicked an electron off the carbon, which will move this negative charge that was on this carbon onto the oxygen. So this oxygen will now have the negative charge. And what it will then do is it will nick this proton from the uh, imidazole ring of the histidine 447, and it will then bind to that to neutralize the positive and negative charge. And what molecule will you overall get coming out of the enzyme now? Okay, so let's show this coming out. You will get this alcohol group restored to its former glory. You'll have this these two methylene groups, and then right on the end, you'll have this nitrogen with these three methyl groups coming off. Okay, one, two, three, and then a positive charge on that. So this is the molecule that I called choline before. So we have produced choline so far. Okay, so we're halfway there. We now just need to produce the acetic acid. Right, so what has happened here then now? Let's draw the final stage out. So what is left after the choline's come out? So it's getting nice and simpler now, because I don't have to draw that choline anymore. Right, so here's the active site again. OK. And here is the anionic site over here, which is no longer needed because the choline has vacated, basically. So here is this glutamate residue at position 334. So here is glutamate 334 again. Okay, and now importantly, because this is still involved, this has still got something linked to it, here is serine 203, which is linked basically by an ester link to this um, acetate group here. Okay, so we want this to be removed basically. And finally, over here, we then have histidine, 447, which has this imidazole ring still coming off here. So this five-membered ring where four, three of the members are carbon and two of the members are nitrogen. Here's the imide bond, and then just saturate it with hydrogens. Okay, now what's going to happen is a water molecule is going to come in, and you're going to hydrolyze that bond between the acetate group and the serine. So basically, the whole reaction we were trying to do was to hydrolyze the bond between the acetate, the acetate group, or well, the acetyl group of uh, the acetylcholine and the choline of the acetylcholine. What we've done is we've kind of deferred the task of doing that. So it's basically what's happened is the serine has displaced the choline, so it's replaced the choline in this ester link. The acetyl group is now ester linked to the serine, and now what we've, we've got is a uh, ester link here that's easier to break just by a water molecule coming in than was the ester link between the acetyl group and the choline. So what will happen is basically you'll split this water here, you'll split the carbon and the oxygen apart, you'll shove this oxygen uh, this alcohol group here onto this carbon to create acetic acid. So what you'll get then is, let's put this over here, so you'll get H3C and then you'll get uh, the restored carboxylic acid group now, so the carbonyl group and the alcohol group. So that will come off and then you'll have the restored alcohol group because this hydrogen will bind to that oxygen and serine 203 will be restored. So the enzyme is then back to the beginning and it can catalyze another round. And remember, each of these acetylcholinesterase enzymes 
can uh, break down up to 10,000 uh, acetylcholine molecules in a second. Okay, so that's the mechanism by which the acetylcholinesterase enzymes work. And it's really an archetypal example of a serine hydrolase enzyme. Right, so let's now discuss myasthenia gravis before we move on to the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So we'll come back to those pictures that I drew uh, when we discuss acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. But I want you to have some sort of motivation for what we are actually trying to treat, basically, to understand what the purpose of these drugs is. Okay, so, basically, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease where you produce antibodies which binds to the alpha-1-2, uh, beta-1, delta-epsilon nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so let me draw a picture. So here is our alpha motor neuron, axon terminal, that we've drawn many times now. Here is our sarcolemma with these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on them, which are specifically of this alpha-1-2, beta-1, delta-epsilon type. And what you are basically going to produce is antibodies which will bind to these alpha-1, 2, beta-1, delta-epsilon nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So am I brave enough to try and squash an antibody in here? I've done it now. We're doing it. So here is our antibody coming like this. And it's bound, basically, as I sort of shown there. So this is an autoantibody here against the uh, neuromuscular junction form of uh, the nicotin nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, now what is the result of binding these antibodies to the extracellular uh, domain of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors? Well, the result is that when this uh, presynaptic neuron releases acetylcholine, into the synaptic cleft, is the acetylcholine going to be able to bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor anymore? No, is the answer. It can't bind because the antibody's in the way. So, um, that's going to lead to uh, the alpha motor neuron not being able to have an effect on the myocyte. So, if it can't bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, then the acetylcholine cannot cause the contraction within that myocyte. So, basically, in myasthenia gravis, what you get is an inability to contract your muscles, and that's known as muscle weakness. It's really, really difficult to uh, contract your muscles, so you'll really, really have to put so much conscious effort into actually moving your muscles because you need to recruit so many um, alpha motor neurons to actually stimulate the muscles in order to make them contract uh, because you need a huge amount of acetylcholine to actually produce a noticeable effect on the acetylcholine receptors. Okay, so you get muscle weakness. Even worse, these antibodies actually lead to the destruction of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So initially what they do is they bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and just block the acetylcholine from being able to bind. But gradually what they lead to is just down-regulation of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So you can actually get a reduction in the level of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma by 70%. So if you basically got 10 receptors on the muscle cell, basically seven of them will be removed in people with myasthenia gravis, up to seven anyway. Uh, so it's a huge reduction in how many receptors you've actually got on your skeletal muscle cells, okay? And this leads to uh, your muscle cells being incredibly difficult to stimulate and you not being able to move properly. Well, not being able to uh, use your muscles properly. So, for instance, they often present with uh, symptoms like ptosis, okay? So they'll often have a droopy eyelid. They won't be able to hold their eyes open because uh, the muscles uh, that elevate the eyelid are too weak, basically. They can't just, they can't uh, stimulate them uh, to contract enough to hold the eyelid open. Okay, and usually, uh, for reasons that I don't understand, and I don't know if they are understood, it usually just affects one side, so you will usually only see one of the eyelids droopy, and the other ones open normally. That's just a phenomenon that is observed. Okay, so, 
One last little interesting fact about myasthenia gravis, it affects 1 in 2,000 people, so it's not too uncommon, it's not um, ridiculously rare, like, <laughs> um, uh, what's that one? Uh, Harlequin ichthyosis is a very rare disease. I think that's something like one in a billion or something. Uh, so it's not ridiculously rare. Okay, right. So how are we going to treat myasthenia gravis? So let's go over what the problem is. We're releasing acetylcholine, but a huge fraction of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors have either got the antibody bound to them, this autoantibody bound to them, and therefore can't bind acetylcholine, or else have actually been down-regulated and no longer are there. So the problem is that there are very little receptors that the acetylcholine can actually bind to and activate. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is, if we have more acetylcholine, that would mean that we find it easier to stimulate the muscle cells. So there aren't, not all of your nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are going to be uh, bound to the autoantibody. There will be some that are free. So if we could just stimulate these ones that are free, then we'd be in a better place, basically. So um, the way we can do this is by increasing the acetylcholine signal, and the way that we can do that is by stopping the breakdown of acetylcholine, or at least slowing it down. If we slow the breakdown of acetylcholine down, then more acetylcholine will stimulate the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and uh, that will mean that we're more likely to be able to actually cause our skeletal muscle cell to contract, and so the muscle weakness should at least be lowered. So that's what, uh, that's one of the major things that, uh, nic uh, that acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are used to treat. And in the next video, we'll start to look at the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and which ones of them are used to treat myasthenia gravis.